Good morning, everyone. Um, I am thrilled to welcome back Dr. Deborah Kornstein, who's our Grand Rounds speaker today. Um, Dr. Kornstein is joining us from Memorial Sloan Kettering, where she is the Chief of the General Medicine Service there, as well as the Director of Clinical Effectiveness, and she's also a Professor of Medicine at Cornell. Um, prior to joining Memorial Sloan Kettering, she was at, on faculty at Sinai with us for 16 years. Where she was the founding. Yes, yeah. <laughs> on that one. Yes. No, I mean, it's significant and important and good. Um, where she was the with us, she was the founding director of the primary care residency program and track, and an APD in the internal medicine residency program. Her research interests include overuse and uh, conflict of interest and evidence-based medicine and understanding factors to improve value-based care. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Carlson. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. It's been a while. We were just talking about how long. And it's good to see so many familiar faces and a little shocking to see some unfamiliar faces. Um, but it's been a long time since I've been here. So um, I, I have to preface this by saying that those of you who know me, you know, this is like has not been like traditionally my area of kind of interest. And I got involved in this because I work at Sloan Kettering with Peter Bach, who is a kind of national guy. He's quoted in the Wall Street Journal like every day around issues of drug cost and drug pricing. And he has a grant from the art. He has for several years had a grant from the Arnold Foundation to develop kind of understanding of drug pricing and also to educate policymakers. It's very policy directed. And they recently got. A, in the grant extension, they want an arm of the project to do medical education, to educate sort of all levels, medical students, trainees, attending, so that they brought me involved as the med ed person. And so I started getting into this stuff, and it's, it turns out it's like really fun stuff. So I'm not a world expert in this. I'm relatively new. I've only been kind of working in this for about a year. So you might ask me questions that I cannot answer. <laughs> but hopefully I know a little bit more than you do, and I can show you some stuff you don't you don't already know. So I personally have no relationships with for-profit entities. My spouse does, which irritates me to have to disclose this because conflicts of interest are one of my things. But I don't understand it in any way that could possibly influence anything I say because I truly have no idea what he does. <laughs> um, he's like a basic science kind of guy. So all right, so we're going to talk about drug spending and drug prices, which are two different things. Talk a little bit and hopefully open it up about how we all experience this issue. And then I'm really going to dig into why prices are high, which is really the meat of the talk, and then some proposed solutions. So this graph shows our drug spending compared to other countries. And you all, I mean, you all know this. This is compared to other countries in the developed world. And this is annual per capita spending on pharmaceuticals. So we spend annually $1,200 for every person in this country on pharmaceuticals which you can see is much higher than the spending in, in any other country. And this is from 2018, but the, I mean, this has been the case for actually several years. This is the most recent data that's currently available. And again, as everybody knows, those drug prices have been rising. So, or not, I'm sorry, not drug prices, drug spending has been rising. So this shows, again, per capita spending in the US over time. And you can see that in the 90s, it really started skyrocketing, and with the exception of this little dip in here, it's basically continued to rise. It's flattened out a little bit over the last year or so, but pretty much, I mean, it's been this inexorable rise. And probably that this rise that we see that's more rapid has to do with the release of a lot of new drugs that are very expensive. And this shows the trends over time compared to other countries. So here we are in the US in the light orange on the top. And again, you can see the, the Drug spending in other countries is rising as well in the developed world. And this has been something that people all across the world are paying attention to. But it's a much bigger problem here. And the, thing that, the thing I think is most interesting about this graph is you can see until the mid-90s, we were like right there in the middle of the pack with other countries. So something really changed dramatically in the 1990s that led to where we are today. But I, I think really the most interesting part about this is like all this stuff, where we were not spending any more than anybody else up until 20 years ago. So, you know, it, high spending on drugs could be due to a couple different things. It could mean that we're just using a lot more drugs or we're paying more for what we do use. And as someone interested in overuse and unnecessary care, and unnecessary care 
I often think we use drugs that we probably shouldn't use. But it turns out that we're really not using a lot more drug than other countries. So this shows us over here compared to other countries in just the volume of drug use in, that, in the country. So what you can see is we're on the higher side compared to other countries in terms of volume of drugs that we use, but we're not like, we're not crazy, we're not the highest. And we're certainly in the kind of same range as, the, as other countries. So it does not seem to be the case that we're spending a lot more because we're just using a lot more drug in everybody. And similarly, I think a lot of people think that we don't, we don't, well, we probably don't use enough generic medication. And this is a problem that like people have always talked about for many, many years about, you know, trying to get more generic use. But it turns out that we do very well compared to other countries in use of generics in this country. We're actually, there's data um, that's a little bit more recent than this that shows that we actually are number one in the developed world for use of generics in terms of the proportion of drug that we use in the country that are, that are generic. So, and you can see, like, we do much better than a lot of European countries in, in generic drug use. So that's not the problem either. The problem, really, is that we just spend a lot more money for every drug compared to other countries. So I'm going to show you two slides that, that are kind of the same data looked at, looked at in two different ways, because I know this is a little bit hard to see. But this is a bunch of common, again, branded drugs. Advair, Danubia, Lantus, Crestor. And these are kind of where we live up here. These are more specialty level drugs. And you can see that here's, here's the amount we spend in the US, and this, these are just other developed countries in the world. So just visually, you can see we're spending orders of magnitude more for, for these drugs than other countries are. And this is, this is similar data, but it shows a, one other thing, which is why I wanted to, uh, to show it. So this, these colors are rankings, and that, that's, so don't worry about the color coding. So you can see that basically we're number one in, in every category in terms of the amount of money we spend. So the top row is the per capita spending, which I already showed you. The second row is retail pharmaceutical spending. So that's drugs that, are, that people go to pharmacies to get, which is most of what we're going to be talking about today. And then these are specific drugs that were actually also on the same graph. So you can see for Crestor, it's $86 in the US versus much like you know, 20 in France. Similarly, and you know, for Mira, for rheumatoid arthritis, 2,500 versus you know as low as low as still still a lot, but 982 in France. And then this one is really interesting too. So this is new chemical entities. So this is newly released drugs. Some of these are biologics. These are these are the brand new things. And you can see we're much much more, sometimes tenfold, the what other countries are spending on those things. So drug prices are really high, and that's important. As I mean, we I think we all know because it creates a lot of challenges with affordability. So this is from a nationally representative sample of US adults, which in, in that uh, Kaiser Family Foundation surveyed. And what they found is about 25% of people reported difficulty paying for their drugs. So this is insured on, most of these people, you know, this, this is representative. So most of the people were insured in this sample. Um, and similarly, in the US, we have much higher rates of cost-related non-adherence. So this shows on the left, so this is the percent of the population. This is in an older sample. These are people over 65 across the world. So this is the percent of people reporting cost-related non-adherence, and that's the blue line in each country. And then the bar is the odds ratio compared to the UK for cost-related non-adherence. So you can see that in the US, about 17% of older adults report cost-related non-adherence. And that represents a rate that is sixfold higher than the rate in the United Kingdom. So again, like everyone in this room has seen this. Um, and, and so I'm actually curious, like any, what your experiences with, with this have been in terms of how often it happens. Has anyone even in your own life had to, had to sort of have challenges with paying for drugs? Any great patient stories about terrible things happening?
Yeah. And we see a ton in our type patients who are on uh, GLP ones to SOT twos come September when they don't have to Right. They can't get their medications because it's just prohibitively expensive. So again, their A1Cs between like August and you know, December are terrible, and then January when they restart again. I had a patient yesterday who has, um, she's a nurse and she's about to retire. She's like, tomorrow she's retiring. And so she's been looking at Medicare managed care plans and she has psoriasis and she's on like one of those like fancy immune modulating like psoriasis drugs. And none of the Medicare managed care plans that she's looked at will cover her meds. And she'd been on like a million, she'd tried a million things before she ended up on this and it's been incredibly good for her. And so she told me she looked into like just buying it if cause she, if she had one of these plants and it would cost her eight thousand yes. dollars for three that was for a three month supply so not for a one month supply but still like eight thousand dollars so she's going to change her medicines basically she's going to have to to stuff that totally doesn't work because she there's no possible way she can pay for this medication that does work um, yeah and I also my other great story about this is which isn't great but. I have a diabetic, a similar, who like couldn't afford. He was on a long-acting insulin, and his insurance like kept changing which one they would pay for and everything. And then, so at one point, they wouldn't pay for any of them, and so the pharmacist gave him NPH instead, instead of like Lantus, at the same like unit-to-unit -unit dose. And I mean, luckily he's so it was like he was taking. So then he came to see me, and he'd been like taking, he'd been taking it, and I was like, no one called me, like no one told me. And luckily, he's so insulin resistant that it actually didn't matter at all. But like, he could have died. I mean, it was it was crazy. Yeah. So a big problem. Okay. So now I want to talk about why prices are high, and that's what we're going to spend most of the rest of the time talking about. So why are prices high? What do you guys think? We have no leverage. Okay. Greed. Right. So we don't negotiate. So who who doesn't negotiate? Right, exactly. Okay, so middlemen. It's a criminal activity. <laughs> pricing of drugs. What, what specifically? There's monopoly and, and price fixing. And, and, uh, and, and the laws sort of back it. By, uh, I'm not sure why. You know, um, vaccines used to be made by, by the health department. The Tussis vaccine was invented in Michigan, but there's no reason that the government can't manufacture drugs and give them away. But uh, in my own case, I, I was prescribed a drug and I was told it was $2,500 uh, copayment. And then I applied for charity. So the scam goes in a very complicated way, and even your aunt might get it as charity, but, but that's part of a scam. And the same thing with. with some brand name drugs where they give you a discount up front, and then a year later, bingo, your, your discount is over, yeah. and, and you're hit. So I, th I think uh, stuff going on that's just really greed, greed and, and it should be illegal. It's, it violates antitrust laws, and just nobody enforces Excellent. So we're going to get to all that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, one thing that industry always says is the reason prices are high is because of the cost of, of research and development. So, that's essentially, like, kind of not true. Um, I'm, not, I'm not actually really going to talk about that. I think a lot of people think that it's low use of generics, which I've already shown you is not true. People also think that advertising and detailing and stuff raises the price of drugs. And there may be some truth to that, actually. And then government inability to negotiate price. And then middlemen in the system. So I'm, I'm actually going to really show you how the system works to get into a little more nitty gritty of like how these prices get inflated. And the, I, I just want to clarify, there are two different really real systems. One is for prescription drugs, which are basically where all of us operate. And the other is for outpatient drugs. And outpatient drugs are drugs that are administered by doctors in their office. So these are like outpatient chemotherapy, outpatient IV chemotherapy, a lot of the new like RA drugs. Um, and that's, I'm going to, I'll show you a little bit about that at the end, but I don't think any of us really, really do that, but it's, it's crazy, actually, it's even crazier. So I'm going to talk mostly about prescription drugs. So these are all the players in the, in the prescription drug system. So obviously we have pharmaceutical companies who manufacture the drugs. We have wholesalers who are essentially middlemen in the supply chain. 
So they buy drug from the manufacturer, they kind of store it, and then they ship it to people who then distribute it to patients. So they're skimming money off the top, but they're not a huge player in, like, in, in, in the system other than that. There are pharmacies that dispense drugs, obviously. There are health insurers that insure the patients. There are patients, and there are uh, pharmacy benefit managers, which Eva alluded to, so PBMs. So I'm going to say a lot more about what PBMs do. So PBMs are middlemen. They are they're basically hired by insurance companies to negotiate drug prices with manufacturers and to create the formula. So these are the people that create the formularies for each insurer. So this arose, as far as I can tell, the history of it is a lot of this stuff is really, really opaque because, and when, I, when we start talking about like the money, like I'm going to show you kind of how the money tracks through the system and ends up getting kind of inflated. A lot of this is guesses because it's all considered proprietary information. So PBMs basically arose in, when HMOs kind of came out in the 90s. And I think probably are correlated with when U.S. prices start, U.S. costs, drug costs started to go up compared to other countries. Although that that correlation is not like established, that's kind of my own personal theory. So essentially, the insurance company hires the PBM to negotiate prices and then cr and create their formulary. The PBM also negotiates with the pharmacy to set prices for drugs for the, for the insure for those pe people with a particular insurance. So they're again negotiating on behalf of the insurance company, and you know they're basically a middleman throughout the entire system. So here's here's how it works. Okay, we're just gonna we're gonna start with the pharmaceutical company. So the pharmaceutical company manufactures their drug and they set a price called the WAC, the wholesale acquisition cost of the drug. So that's like the list price of the drug. So the wholesaler buys the drug from the pharmaceutical company and they usually negotiate a discount from the WAC. So they'll like bring it down a little bit. So they'll pay a little bit less than the WAC. The pharmacy then buys the drug from the wholesaler for usually a little, for oh, it's also a negotiated price. It's usually a little bit more than the WAC. Although, the, the example with dollars that I'm showing, going to show you has it a little bit wrong, but that's because I need it up. So, um, so then the pharmacy has the drug. The patient comes to fill a prescription, and the pharmacy sets a price for that patient. The price depends on what insurance the patient has because the PBM has negotiated that price. So there's a price for that patient. The patient comes in and pays whatever they owe, which is either a copay, which may be fixed or tiered or whatever, or a coinsurance, which is when they pay a percentage of the cost instead. The balance is paid, the pharmacy is then made whole by the PBM, which pays the balance plus a little extra, which is a dispensing fee. The, and then the health insurer pays back the PBM with a little bit of a service fee on top of that, so the PBM makes a little money. But at the same time, there's been a rebate. So when the, when the PBMs negotiate costs with the manufacturers, the way they do that, bless you, is by negotiating a rebate. So they say, we'll make your statin top tier in our formulary, but you got to pay us some cash to do that for each. And it's basically for each dispensing. It's not like a, it's, it's not paid up front. It's like for each drug that's prescribed, they get money back. So basically it lowers the price of the drug for that company. So at the same time that all this other stuff is going on, the rebate has come from the pharmaceutical company to the PBM, most of which gets passed on to the health insurer as part of like as part of their deal. There's a lot of money floating through the system, and I'm going to show you what it looks like with an example, which again, I totally made this up <laughs> just to make the numbers kind of work out, and so they're not exactly right, but also they vary, and so it's a little bit hard to do this. So let's say the WAC is $100. The pharmaceutical company sets a price, 100, this drug is going to cost $100. The wholesaler buys it for 90 from the pharmaceutical company, so that's a little bit of a discount. The pharmacy then buys it from the wholesaler. I have that as 95, but it actually more realistically might be like 105, like a little bit more than the WAC. So now the pharmacy has it. They then set a price for a patient with insurance X, so let's say that's $120. So the patient pays, let's say, a 20% coinsurance, so they're paying $24 out of their pocket. Uh, the remainder is paid by the PBM to the pharmacy, plus a little bit of a, um, a service fee. At the same time, the pharmaceutical company paid a rebate to the PBM of $25, 20 of which gets passed on to the health insurer, five of which stays with the PBM. The health insurer pays back the PBM for what they pay the pharmacy, um, but they've also gotten this other $20 in their pocket. Do insurance negotiate with pharmacies? 
the PBM negotiates with the pharmacies. To, for that insurance. On behalf of the insurance, yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that there is a patient who can go to CV and they don't have CV here, let's say, but they, they want to take a paper prescription, yeah yeah so they negotiate with the with the pharmacies so the big chains have a lot more power and they like can bring the prices down that but thank you for bringing up Caremark um, because the PBMs are names we all know so there are three PBMs in the US that cover most of the population so the number one is Express Scripts by a lot Caremark CVS Caremark is number two, and the third is United Healthcare. So those three are the PBMs that cover like almost everybody in this country. There are a couple of other small ones, but they're not very relevant. So that's why I mean Express Express Scripts is incredibly powerful. Um, but yeah, they negotiate different prices with different pharmacies. There's something like Target or Walmart that four dollar pharmacy. Four dollar drug. How how did that sort of I'm not sure how that works. My guess is that they're negotiating themselves with companies. Um, those are all generics, pretty much. I think 100%. Those are all. Um, but I think that those companies are big enough that do that. It's really only the huge companies. It's like Target, Walmart, and CVS has their own. So CVS is like they are their own PBM, so they're negotiating directly. I don't know how that works, but I think that Target and Walmart probably negotiate directly with the companies that are manufacturing those generics and they, they make it, because it's a, that's a huge market for those people. So it's a way of like bypassing the um, formularies, but they have just as much power because they because it's such a huge volume across the country. Oh, that's right, CVS is Target now, so that's probably also Caremark. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Walmart's the only one then that's... Um, but CVS and Target have different prices on there, and uh, don't they have different formats? It's crazy. Everybody has different markets. Yeah. When you buy from all these like mail in pharmacies for three months and pay no copay, and you still can't it's so it's it's smaller. No, it's just. For my, my, my plan is much smaller. Right? It depends on the drug, too. Right? Yeah, yeah, it depends yeah, and the but company and the situation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cheaper. It's cheaper. No, and you're insured. Yes. Yeah. So, my issue is who eats that, who gets, who is. Paying that difference, the PBM, the pharmacy. So those are examples. So a lot of the time, that is the PBM sort of yeah. doing its running its own pharmacy. Right. So CVS obviously runs a lot of PBMs and pharmacies, but Express, Express Scripts also runs their own mail order pharmacy. They don't have retail pharmacies, but they have mail. So you're basically buying it directly from the PBM through their own pharmacy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's and it's convenient. Like I'm nothing against that. I mean, I think mail order three months. It's like way more convenient than yeah. going to a pharmacy. I remember last year there was a big deal about how pharmacists were not allowed to tell you that you'd be able to get a medicine cheaper because, like, you had to specifically ask that. They weren't allowed to tell you. You had to tell ask them. They used to be less expensive way to pay the medicine, and then they, then they were allowed to say, "Oh yeah, this." Don't use your insurance this way. Yeah. I can't remember what that was. I, I mean, my get my I would bet that it's part of their deals with the PBMs, because um, it's not a law. It's not like a right. gag order law law. Well, I, I my guess is that it was because of contracts. Um, I don't know though. I don't know that for sure. But yeah, it is often the case that if you just pay cash, like if you get like a like, you know, amoxicillin. It's often cheaper to pay cash than to like pay. It, it's, it's totally insane. Um, but yeah. Anyway, so when you follow the money through and you look at like how much everybody pro like profits and loses from the scenario I laid out here, the pharmaceutical company is making sixty-five dollars off of that drug. The PBM is making fifteen. The insurer is losing eighty-six. But remember, they also have premiums that the that the patient is paying them or somebody's paying them. The patient is out twenty-four dollars pocket, the pharmacy's making 25, the whole, and the wholesaler's just skimming off the top. I mean, I think the amount that wholesalers make off each drug is actually quite small, it's just that they do huge volume, and so that's that's basically how they make their money. And why, so, why uh, haven't uh, the PBMs taken over that wholesaler role, um, especially those that are dispensing drugs that are I mean, I think in the case when they're dispensing drugs directly, it's possible that they do serve as their own wholesalers. But wholesalers are are just sort of in the distribution business, so I think the PBMs probably just don't want to be bothered in terms of like distributing to individual pharmacies and all that stuff. 
Um, but essentially, the bottom line is like everybody, there are all these different entities are making money in this system. Mm -hmm. So the manufacturers are obviously making a lot. Um, the, the pharmacies are making a lot. I, ne I never really realized that like running a pharmacy was such a profitable business, but they're making a lot of money off of all this like shenan all these shenanigans. You know, PBMs that are essentially, like PBMs and wholesalers that are not in any way serving the interests of, you know, consumers or patients or doctors are making all this. These are big businesses, all of them. And providers, this has to do with drugs that are given in the office, which I'll get to at the end. Um, but like, basically everybody's making money, except patients who are losing money. So I want to do a little fun exercise. So I have kind of a blank flow diagram on the back of this. So if you pass these back, I want to just take five minutes, maybe less, and imagine a competitive market. So this is, for example, the insulin market. So you are the manufacturer of Lantus, and then all these new long-acting insulins come on the market. What are you going to do to maintain your primacy in the market? So I want you to like map out like what the money in the system will look like when you do your thing to maintain your primacy in the market. It's very confusing. That's why I put the other one on the other side just so you can see the, the examples before. Yeah, and it took me many hours to like make all those numbers work, and they still don't really work, so I don't expect perfection. Okay, let's. I love the fact that you guys are arguing about this. It's making me so happy. It's like a ring bell. 
So bring it on. What, what do you guys think? Ring your bell, the wire. Right. All right, what do you guys think? Well, Eva. Well, so I was thinking that if my, I'm going to say M page is my old drug. It's less expensive for me to make. So I'm going to give the PBM manager a bigger kickback, a bigger bonus to do to rebate to, rebate to pick my drug than they would for Levin. Other than the other ones. So I'm going to say, like, I'm going to try to give them more money because of my drug, which is cheaper than you do. Okay, excellent. I'm going to increase the price too a little bit, right? I think if I sell enough of it, I'll break it. Okay, so you're going to give them more kickbacks to bring your volume up, but you're going to maybe make less margin on each drug. Possibly, yes. Okay. Any other ideas? Lowering the lot. So lowering your price to make it more competitive so people will. Okay, that's an idea. Good. I think you can. I think well, that would be done through the PBM. That's through your. They can. The, the target is the health insurer. That's what they, they make. The, the PBM doesn't push a drug. That's a push a drug. No. They do. They, do. they, they have, have all the. Yeah, they have all the power because they're the ones negotiating with everybody. The the power to so let me let, let me show you what happened. What happens? So this is the story of insulin. This is why insulin costs like I don't even know like some insane amount of money. Mm -hmm. What they do is the PBM. <coughs> The, the pharmaceutical company gives the PBM a bigger kickback, like you're saying. So they they raise the rebates so that the PBM keeps it top level in the formulary, right? So they're basically bribing them to make it tier one in the formulary. But they don't take a hit. They just raise the whack. They just say, if I'm going to use this kickback, then I'm just going to raise the price of my drug to account for this kickback. That so because what do what do they care? They're going to end up still making the same essentially the same profit off the drug as they ever did. It's just that the price goes up because the rebate went up. So then when you follow the money through the system, when that happens, that, that's the whole key. That is the whole reason why insulin is expensive. This is what happened. New insulins got introduced, and there was competition in the market, and so the rebates went up, and the prices went up, and th th that's just like, and they keep renegotiating, which is why like they, this one's top tier, then this one's top tier, and it's like this like highly competitive market. So they, so they, raise, they give them a $200 rebate, Whatever, most of it gets passed to the health insurer. Then the WAC goes up to $280. It used to be $100. Um, the, again, the, the wholesaler buys it as a, at a discount. The pharmacy buys it from the wholesaler for a little more than that. They set a price. That price is now based on this WAC. So the price is now $300. It used to be whatever, $120. Um, where it's really like the, the, the difference is actually much larger than that. Um, the patient pays their 20% copay, which now went from $24 to $60 in the example I showed you before. The PBM makes them right. Um, the PBM gets reimbursed by the health insurer. The health insurer gets $175. And when you follow all the money through the system, I couldn't get the numbers to work out exactly right. But essentially what happens is the PBM makes more money than they did before, which they're happy about. The patient spends less. And everybody else kind of is about the same. So the fact the patient pays more. I mean, I'm sorry, the patient, sorry, the patient pays more, the PBM makes a little bit more, and everybody else kind of makes the same amount because it's all like there's these like skimming off the top amounts. Except the people that get super screwed are people who don't have health insurance because they're paying this or or that, you know, something close to the whack. Like the price that the pharmacy sets for uninsured patients is a little bit different than the price that they're setting for the insured patients. But it's going to be high because it's it's not going to be less than the whack. Yep. Sorry, if you have the discount programs work, like GoodRx, for example. I'm going to get I'm going to get to that I'm going to get to that. I have a patient on a cholesterol medication that I prescribed, and it's way more expensive to get it through the insurance than it is through the tax GoodRx. Yeah. Yeah. So those are copay coupons. They're called like GoodRx is one of the big companies that makes them. I'm going to get to those in a sec. So just hold that thought. Yeah. Nothing. That's exactly what has happened. That's precisely what's happened in the insulin market. Is that like, you know, this one did it, and then that's why like the prices were, like kept like going up and up and up. It's because the rebates kept going up and up and up. Um, No. See, that's a different thing. I, I'm actually going to get to that, but I can talk about it now. So what happens in the generic market is, so that was basically, or, or a non-competitive market, 
or or with generics being high is a total is a different thing. So what happened with with EpiPen was that there was essentially one manufacturer, and so maybe there used to be one competitor, and I'm not sure if like there was one competitor that went away, but essentially there's a monopoly, so that manufacturer can just raise the price, and it's a, it's not it's not patent protected, so another manufacturer could start making it, but the market is small enough and the potential profit is small enough that they're not motivated to do that. So there's like no reason for a competitor to enter the market. Um, that's what happened with pyrimethamine, Daraprim, which I was gonna, so well, I'll get to that, but essentially it's a different reason for like the same kind of perversity. Why did this happen with insulin opposed to like, why does this happen with statins to the same extent or any other class? Well, I think, I think one of the things that's different about insulins is that they're never, there's no generic alternative because the um, like the technology keeps getting better, okay. so the only ones that are available generically are like NPH and regular, and so with with the statins, there were there were generic equivalents pretty early on in the game, and so I think it kept the prices somewhat down. But insulin, there's never it's always like a newer and better, yeah. and they and they truly I mean they probably are better to to some extent than the older ones that are out there. But that I think that's what was special about the insulin market. You think in a rational market, you know, the only incentive for insurers to pick up or stay with your old drug is they pay less, not because they make more of a margin. Right. And, but then if they're doing by doing that, they're passing higher costs to the consumer. Eventually, that will harm them because insurers, you know, consumers will move to another company that gives them a lower price. You know. Yeah. But so you know, I guess maybe the regulations screw all the system. But if you, you know, if you were purely kind of economics. You know, shouldn't shouldn't this this scheme should work? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't think there are a lot of regulations governing this. To be honest, I think it's just that they're all doing the same thing, and I, I don't know. But you're right. Like it should. It doesn't function like a regular market. The other thing is consumers don't have infinite yeah. choice. Yeah. Well, they have choice of usually a couple. Well, it's true, but like, the consumer is also your your is, is also you know more sane. It's just choosing the best kind. Of, so it's true that it's not individually. Unless you are buying your insurance, which probably is a small percentage of the population, that you're, you know, and it ends up costing for a lot of other reasons, yes, way, way more. You know, is that? But there's still, you know, like you know, the big, you know, yeah. the, 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 you know, the, the different whatever entities that buy insurance also have choices, and they're trying to protect their employees or whatever. So again, so maybe that is. The bargaining chip with unions is like, like because insurance is so expensive and they're so few options. Every time like Sinai changes the insurance company. Where everybody's upset. And it uh, again, it's not. Markets are never perfect, but if you think from like a pure economic perspective, you know, yeah. when somebody, you know, the system has to regulate itself. Te right. Theoretically, we know that. No, I also think it's complicated by the fact that there's so much more going into the price of health insurance and the the different things that people weigh in their health insurance, like doctor networks and like other and like the, the entities that are buying health insurance are trying to keep their other costs down. So there's been increasing price sharing with patients uh, for everything. I mean, you know, like, like high deductible plans are like going up and, and like, I feel like there's so many other things going on at the same time that it perverts the ability, you know, it's hard to even understand how the market would work because it's such a wacko market. Um, okay, anyway, so this is just to show, this is what happened with insulin. So copay coupons. So essentially copay coupons are this way to mask their perversity in the system. So the, so it's the company will say like, well, you know, this price is super high, but don't worry about it. Like you can use the copay coupon. So it's a, it's a way for them to, again, like they're not, the way that they make money is remember, they're not making that much more money when the list price goes up a lot. It's actually just the patient is paying more and the PB and it's like a bribery scheme to keep the PBMs happy. So it allows them to bypass the PBMs so they can, they can charge the patient with the coupon the same amount that they're making off that negotiated price. You know what I mean? They can keep the profit the same, but the patient is paying much less. The, yeah, you're right. The, well, the pharmacy, no, you're right. The pharmacy must be buying it through a different mechanism. Can't take the good that's art to yeah. every CVS, it's only certain CVS. <clears throat> so it's negotiated with a certain level, a certain target, a certain Yeah, you're right. You can't do every single level of the system. Yeah, you're right. Those the ones, those good RX ones. 
yeah, that doesn't make sense. A lot of them come to come. I think a lot of times the the manufacturers make the pharmacies whole. Um, but how they can afford to do that when the price gets super inflated, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I need to look into that. You're right. That for the super expensive drugs, I don't know if they make them for the crazy expense, like the Hep C drugs. They don't. I don't think they make any copay coupons for those, do they? No. Well, yeah, yeah, no, they do. I, I just think I'm not sure how much it saves you. You're no, you're right. It's not like twenty five dollars so. though. It says no more than five dollars per copay. I do not know. I need to look into that more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, you know what? This Harmony thing is for using your insurance to reduce your copay. You're right. So the rest of the money is still coming from the PBM. But right. But some of those programs you're not allowed to use your insurance. Right. So those are that's the mystery. So for those, it's just cutting off what the patient's paying, and they're still getting the same amount from the PBM. And so the manufacturer is taking a small hit. So that makes sense. For the ones though where you can't use your insurance. Um, But they're still paying the wholesaler a cost that's related to the WAC. But the wholesaler. But the wholesale is still buying it from the company for the elevated WAC. Although I don't know how much those save. Like I, I once, you, my daughter has ADHD, and her drugs cost a freaking fortune. And before we we have a high deductible plan, and before we met our deductible, we were spending four hundred dollars a month on her medication, which was insane. And so I got one of those. I got those coupons. Um, and it was through the coupons, it was going to cost half as much. So it was still going to cost 200 bucks a month out of our pocket, but it didn't allow us to contribute. We weren't allowed to contribute that to our deductible. So it ended up not making sense for it. But so my point was, it wasn't that cheap, even with the coupon um, in that case. So I don't know. I need to look into that more. I'm sorry. Oops. Okay, so that's about where the coupons help. So coupons are more and more popular, um, and this just shows like a rise over time in the use of copay coupons. But one of the really interesting things is over half of copay coupons, 53%, apply to drugs that have a generic equivalent. So these are ways of like you know keeping your market share when there's generic competition. Okay, so now, now this we actually talked about this a little bit, but you know like we said before, we use a lot of generic drugs in this country. But they take up, they they uh, account for a minority of our spending, so they actually are cheaper. So this is this graph just shows you that generics actually are cheaper than brand name drugs, which sometimes it seems like there isn't when you look at things like epi, like there's some gen, like even statin generics. I always feel like they're not as cheap as they should be, like but they actually are a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. So you can see the little gold bars are the average price of generics over time. So you can see that they're actually going down, where branded drugs are going up. And so the ratio of like branded to generic prices have been going way, way, way up. But, but generic dr drugs are cheaper, which is good, which is reassuring. However, there's a subset of generic drugs that go up in price every year. And that's because of these like weird perverse situations with no competition. So the best example of that is actually, um, I like to call him like, he's like a cartoon villain. <laughs> The CEO and owner of um, oh, what's it called? Uh, uh, so, so the T. Anyway, I forgot the name of the company that made um, pyrimethamine, which was called the brand name was Daraprim. So it was called Daraprim by that company, but this was a generically available drug. I mean, it was not patent protected. And what happened is, so this is a drug to treat toxoplasmosis. So it has a pretty small market. So what happened is, this guy bought out. They bought the company that used to make this drug. And used to price it at a dollar a pill because it had been around forever, and the co the cost of manufacturing it was nothing. And he basically saw that there was this market, and so he jacked the price up to thirteen fifty, and then to seven hundred and fifty dollars per pill. And the problem is, this is you know, so it's it's a drug to treat a rare disease. 
It has no competitor, really. And there's no motivation for any other manufacturer to manufacture it because, you know, there'll be like st a lot of startup costs associated with that while they like figure out how to manufacture it and get it going and blah, 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 all for a relatively small market. So that would have driven the price down, but, um, but there was just no motivation for any comp competitor to get into the market, which is what happened with that drug. And so, and there was no, it was fully legal. Like everything he did was totally legal. There was nothing illegal about it at all. But then there was such like uproar over it that he ended up, they ended up lowering the price of the drug. I think it's come down a little bit more since 2016, but it's still insanely expensive compared to what it should be and what it used to be. And it's just because of the lack of competition. So it's a totally different problem than the problem with um, branded drugs, but it's still for these like one-off examples, it can be a huge, huge problem. And even EpiPen, what happened is, so for EpiPen, there was then, so EpiPen, the price went way, way up. It used to be cheap, and then it went up. And there is comp, there's now a generic alternative to EpiPen. So the price softened, like came down a little bit. But it turns out that the generic EpiPen is made by the same, Truvada, yes, thank you. Uh, Truven, Truven, right? Turin, Google says Turing. You are Turing, right. Truvada is a drug. Um, sorry about that. So anyway, so the same company that makes EpiPen the brand is making the generic. <laughs> so it's all going to them no matter what. And the generic is not that much cheaper. So instead of $600, it's $400 for two, EpiPen, for two pens. So it's still insanely expensive. Um, but again, there's just, there isn't a competitor out there. And the other problem is if at this point, because they're now two in the market, even though they're made by the same drug, if a third company were to enter that market, and I think there are some issues with EpiPen with the technology of like the pens is like a little bit of an issue. So with the cost of like starting to manufacture it, I think would be a little higher. Um, and I also think the the pen itself may be patented. So somebody would have to like use their own, whatever. But even if they did that, the, having that third competitor in the market would bring the price down, and so they like wouldn't get their money back so quickly. So it's probably not going to be fixed anytime soon. Okay, we only have five minutes left. I just want to talk. I'll go through this really quickly. So the big thing about outpatient drugs is group purchasing organizations or GPOs function similarly. They're, they're also middlemen in the system, but essentially... These are sold to individual practices and doctor's offices. I mean, sometimes it'll be hospitals and hospital systems buying these drugs, but sometimes it's individual practices. So they just, they negotiate on behalf of a bunch of them. They just aggregate them for the sake of negotiating prices. Um, the important thing about outpatient drugs, which I think is really the important thing to know, which I did not know, is that doctors who administer outpatient drugs are reimbursed based on the price of the drug. So if you're a doctor in private practice and you're giving IV chemo in your office, you pay a certain amount of money for that drug and you get reimbursed by the insurance company at that amount plus a percentage of that amount. So like 110% of the price of the drug. So if you administer a drug that costs $100, you're going to get $120. And if you administer a drug that costs $1,000, you're going to get $1,200. And if you administer a drug that costs $10,000, you know, you're you can see they have a huge motivation to use expensive drugs. And in the chemotherapy realm, that is enormously important because the, the, the gap in drug prices is huge. Some of these drugs cost a fortune. And it's totally perverse. And they're doing the same exact work, and they're making like orders of magnitude different money for it. I, for the life of me, cannot understand why the system's like that. But it is. So, exactly. Well, I knew that's, yeah, I, I thought it was for like billing for the, I thought something, somehow the procedure was billed a lot because it's high risk or whatever, but it's the drug. It's just the drug. Yeah. So anyway, so this kind of summarizes what some of the perversities in the system are, and we, we've basically talked about this. So we talked about the competitive market, the PBM power drives rebates up, in drugs without competition, manufacturers <laughs> are incentivized to set a high price. And with generics, the lack of competition drives can drive prices back up. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, in three minutes, about proposed solutions. So essentially, the proposed solutions have to do with either regulation or changing the incentives. I mean, that's like the biggest picture, and that's all the solutions you hear are addressing one or the other, like increasing regulation or changing the, the, um, the incentive, or changing regulation, so like allow, enabling Medicare, Medicare to negotiate prices, or changing the regulation. So essentially, the first two things maybe will work. People do talk about physician level and patient level interventions, 
And the bottom line is, I don't think any of those are going to work. So, like, people talk about cost transparency. I mean, we, we generally know, first of all, that's almost impossible to implement because the cost is different for every single patient, depending on their insurance and the, whatever, their whole situation. So it's almost impossible to tell clinicians at the point of care, like, what it's going to cost the person in front of you to get this drug. Um, and probably that does not work. At the patient level, people have, like, experimented with cost-shifting things, and it doesn't work. I mean, people, if they can't afford it, they can't afford it. So this is a... These are proposed policy solutions in a little bit more detail. So um, which ones should I talk about? So people have talked about reducing regulatory burden, which patent reform is similar. I think like reducing R&D costs, but R&D costs are not the things driving this, so that's probably not going to work. Um, people talk about like limiting the market, so like limiting the time of patent protection for new drugs, which could work because as you know, as we saw, generics are cheaper. So in, the, in a competitive market, it's good to have generics, and so that could help a little bit. It's probably not going to change the whole ballgame. Um, what else? The Trump administration tried... So there's a lot of talk of PBM reform. I mean, there's recognition that they're driving a lot of the costs in the system. The Trump administration actually tried to do a thing that said that all rebates have to go directly to the patient, but it went to the courts, and they basically like aban they abandoned ship on that a few months ago. So that's no longer a part of the Trump administration plan. People have talked a lot about enabling price negotiation, and that's actually part of it's actually part of the administration's plan, and actually the thing that Nancy Pelosi has put forward relatively recently, which I think obviously it makes sense for like Medicare, you know, for the, the public options in this country to be able to negotiate prices. I mean, it's obviously insane that they can. But I wanted to talk a little bit about value-based pricing because that's something that people have talked about that's a little bit less intuitive, <laughs> and I have like one minute. So the whole idea of value-based pricing is that the price will reflect its value on the market, which it never has. I mean, the price is determined by what the market will bear and not by the actual value clinically. And so the idea of value-based pricing is that we would somehow be able to base prices on the value clinically. And these are some of the factors that would go into it. Is there an unmet need? How bad is the drug? What is the prog I mean, how bad is the disease? What are the costs? So, like, what really were your R&D costs? So, like, companies that really do invest a ton would be able to get some money back for R&D. Um, like how much life will it save if this is like truly life-saving drug like we would as a society maybe be able to, to pay more for it how novel is it how toxic or safe is it and all those things would go into the drug price so people are talking more and more about that I just talked about this um, and I think you'll see that going forward and I just want to say that even though at the federal level essentially nothing has happened um, you know the, in these one-off examples like Martin Shkreli gets shamed and prosecuted and whatever, and he has to lower the price of that one drug, but that's affecting very few patients. So nothing really has happened at the federal level, but there's a lot happening at the state level. So in green, this shows you all the states that have proposed legislation to regulate PBMs. So it's a lot of states. So there are a ton of different, you know, proposed bills out there to, to change this around. And I think that there's such broad recognition this is a problem that moving forward, there's going to be um, more action on this. But but it's important to pay attention, I think, as doctors to like what kind of action is happening and make sure that it makes sense. And I just wanted to put in a plug for, this is um, the website that Peter developed with the grant that I mentioned at the beginning, and it has all kinds of resources to like understand this, and it actually has a policy tracker where you can like sort of see what's going on at the policy level, but only at the federal level. I don't think they really have it at the state level, which I think they probably should have. And that's it. It's 9.30. Um, so drug prices are high. It's bad. <laughs> the system is complex with middlemen. And there are a lot of solutions, but not much has been implemented yet. Almost all. Yeah, yeah almost all. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge, huge problem. It's a huge it's and it's true for many, many, many drugs. Like the early stuff happens like in academia with at least part NIH funding, and then it sort of moves into, yeah. Um, nobody knows how to fix it, though. Like, I think every a lot of people are talking about that as a problem, and I'm not sure. It feels like, you know, even if you say, like, you know, 
say like, okay, capitalism, like people are going to try to make money off of everything. But if if the if the research dollars that go into it come from the federal government, then I feel like it's easier to say, okay, if you're going to use our research or if you're going to use our money for research, I feel like there's more of that research. You have more more leverage there. Yeah. Holding the, the yeah, the, the legislators are not. Because there are influence, you know, there's so much influence by the pharmaceutical companies. Right. Um, and, and the NIH is fairly explicit about, uh, you know, say, you know, we put the science out there um, and, you know, it's for the private sector to, right. you know, run with it. Uh, there's no effort to, you know, try to claw back any of the uh, royalties that are. But you, you could sort of imagine a scenario where there could be something like something about how much it, it costs or something about once you make above a certain amount of profit, some proportion has to go back. Yeah. Like you can imagine a scenario, but I, I agree with you. I think politically it's hard to imagine it happening. Just. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you.